Still a baby, bro. <laughs> Ask my wife what it's like whenever I can't find something. <laughs> Or ask it what it's like when Popeyes messes up my spicy chicken order. <laughs> yeah, true story. So I love their pie, spicy chicken strip dinner. Those spicy strips are incredible. Right? So they gave me regular strips. They, they're disgusting compared. And I kicked the bag. <laughs> now, let me, let me tell you why it was stupid. First of all, because I let my anger get the best of me. There was barbecue sauce in the bag. <laughs> All over my walls. Oh, man. So my wife looks at me like, how do you feel now? And I'm like, oh, stupid chicken. I'll, I'll take those tenders outside and put a bullet in them. You know? <laughs> you know? I, was pretty, I, really, I really kicked it. I was really angry. Like, I had a really rough day, and I just wanted my spicy strips. And they weren't there. I was so mad. Oh, man. And then, you know, the worst part is I live on the west side. So the nearest Popeyes is... 10 minutes at any direction, I'm like, bro, which in retrospect really isn't that far, but you've had a bad day, it's really far. <laughs> so you're a sinning pastor? Yep. Sorry, guys, I'm not Jesus. <laughs> if you came here looking for Jesus, we'll find him in the text, but you ain't gonna find him on me. He'd be in me, but you know, I'm not him. But let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you for being our God. We thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. We thank you for your grace, for your faithfulness, Lord. We thank you for the ability to gather together and to love you and to worship you and to praise you in song and in word and in deed and in fellowship, Lord. We ask that your Holy Spirit would grace us with his presence this evening, Lord, that you would be the power through your word this evening, now that I would be nothing but a vessel. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'd get me out of your way, get me out of my way, have your way. We pray for these babies in the back, the ones that are struggling this evening, that you'd help them, comfort them, Lord, help them to be at peace and to have a good time back there with the other kids. And we ask, Father, that again, you would show up mightily tonight, that your word would do the work in us that he is seeking to do, that you'd cut away the things in us that we've allowed, and that you'd fill us with the things that you desire to be in us, Lord. We just want you. Jesus. Here we are, Lord. Use us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we get into Genesis chapter 20 this evening. Now, Genesis 20 kicks off in an interesting way. If we remember last week, chapter 19, God, well, starting in 18, 18 and 19 is like one big context. The angels and God visit Abraham, and you know, we saw all that good stuff. And God reveals to Abraham what he is about to do in chapter 18. That he has heard the cry of Sodom, of Gomorrah, of the surrounding cities, and it's come up to his ears, and the wickedness has just risen. And God says, I'm sending my guys down there, they're going to check it out, and I will know everything. Basically, what's been said, I'll know if it's true or not. And he already knew. He's just simply disclosing to Abraham what he's going to do. And the angels go down, and we saw that Abraham begs and contends on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lord, would you, you know, overthrow the just, the righteous, and the wicked alike? And God says no. Then we get into chapter 19. We get down there, and we find there isn't really anything righteous going on down there. We saw that the men of the city trapped the angels in the house. They blocked the door, and they're pounding on the door, telling Lot, open the door and give us these guys. We want to rape them. Straightforward, but we want to rape them. Lot comes out and tries to contend with them. No, my guy, don't do this. This is wrong. He said, give them over or we're going to do it to you. And remember, the angels pull Lot in and they blind the men. Supernatural, they just, all of them. And it says all the men from every quarter of the city came here to do this. And it says all of them were struck with the blindness. And in a blind stupor, they're trying to find the door still. Apparently to get these angels. They didn't know they were angels. They just thought they were dudes. And we saw that's where the word Sodom comes from. Sodomy comes from Sodom, from probably this particular text. The sodomizing of a person, that's where it comes from. Because Sodom, we remember, means to burn. It doesn't necessarily mean anal, anal intercourse. It just it means to burn, but it comes from this. They burned with such a wicked passion. And we saw God have the angels tell Lot, his wife, his kids, get out of the city. This place is going down. Get out. And, you know, after some arguing finally the angels grab them remove them we saw that we talked about how i believe that was a very real picture of the rapture before the wrath of god to fall 
they get off into the city of Zoar and they end up going into the caves that God had told them and God just wipes all that valley out and turns to nothingness. We talked about all the good stuff about how there's a museum of archaeology here in New Mexico where the archaeologists actually found the believed site of Sodom. You can go there today. It's it's the, what is it? It's a Trinity Southwest Archaeological Museum. It's off of Jefferson. You'll see the glass shards. You'll see pottery pieces. You'll see little fragments of toys and things from that city. So, I mean, it's worth going to see if you ever are curious about the science behind it all and the archaeology behind it. But then we get into chapter, we're toward, towards the end of chapter 19, and it says that Abraham walked out and he saw the city up in flames, shocked. God, you said that you wouldn't overthrow the wicked and the righteous, and he didn't. But Abraham didn't only knew part of God's plan. He, didn't, he just assumed that God was going to spare the city because, well, there must be 10 people there. Well, he was wrong. God didn't spare the city because there wasn't 10 people there. I question whether or not Lot and his family were even righteous. Yeah. You know, I'm sure in Abraham's mind, well, they're my nephew and my family, of course they're righteous. Eh. You know, sometimes we put a little too much faith in our loved ones because some of them are pretty stinking wicked. Just saying. But he overthrows it and that's how the chapter ends. Well, technically the chapter ends with, you know, we, we saw that Lot and his daughters, they went and slept with their father. They got impregnated by their father. They thought the world ended and it was just them. And they gave birth to Moab and Ammon. And later on, we'll see that these two people groups become great nations that become wicked enemies of Israel. And that's part of my theory on Abraham's falter in serving God as he keeps trying to rescue Lot. Well, now we get into chapter 20 and we pick up from there. And it's a little odd because as we get into chapter 20, Nothing is mentioned about Sodom, Gomorrah, or the overthrow of the cities. It just jumps into chapter 20, verse 1. Is, now Abraham journeyed from there toward the land of the Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur. Then he sojourned in Gerar. So Abraham was living up in Hebron, and he comes down south to the southern end of Israel to the Negev. And the Negev is just the whole southern end of Israel. It's a it's a dust ball to this day. It's like it's like going to southern New Mexico. If you ever want to know what Israel's like, New Mexico is a really good geography of what Israel looks like. Up north is very lush, full of forest. You know, as you get towards Colorado, it's just green, beautiful. It's lush, lakes and rivers and streams and fish and wildlife. It's beautiful. And as you work your way down to Albuquerque, it's we got trees. You know, what I mean, it's, we got so you can see the mountains, but like Albuquerque is nothing. That's kind of how Jerusalem is. And if you keep going south, you end up hitting Roswell. And you know, Carlsbad, and it's just a dust ball down there for the most part. There's nothing special. Like the first time I went hunting, it was down that way. I was thinking 60 foot trees and no, it's, you're basically in the desert. <laughs> you're like you're in the wilderness, man. There's there's trees and like, they're like tree shrubs. And I mean, it's it's technically still the, the, the wilderness, and but it's it wasn't what I had in mind hunting. You know, it's, but that's down south. That's very much how Israel is. Maybe dustier though. It's very just dry and sandy and deserty. It says you're going towards you know Egypt and towards the deserts in, in that Arabian area and whatnot. But that's where he went. Now what I find interesting is, do you guys remember Hebron? What's special about Hebron? This appears to be the place where God continues to meet with Abraham. God has several encounters with God. Abraham had several encounters with God in Hebron. God, I mean, last the last time we saw Abraham talking to God, there in Hebron, God shows up manifested in physical form. We don't know if he showed up like that every time, but most of the time so far that God has spoken to Abraham other than his call out of Ur of the Chaldeans was in Hebron. Remember, he calls Abraham out of Ur and Abraham journeys off and he kind of takes a little detour for a while after his dad dies. Then he heads on down to Israel. He stops in Hebron over here. And that's where God finally speaks to him again. Then he goes off on his little escapades and he ends up back in Hebron and that's where God speaks to him again. And then God shows up here. Hebron appears to be a place of meeting between God and Abraham. And I find it interesting that he shoots off to the south end of Israel. Well, it wasn't Israel at the time, but to the Negev of that area. The far southern uh, area. Now, for me, the issue isn't that Abraham goes down to the Negev or down to Gerar is the specific place. What I find to be the issue here is there is no indication that God is leading the expedition. There is no mention of him praying. 
There's no mention of God appearing to him saying, Abraham, it's time to move. There's no mention of any interaction between Abraham and God between this time and him going down there. It's just Abraham. Now, many of the commentators that I read suggested that, well, you know, because where Abraham was in Hebron, remember when he and the, the, the Lord, they stood out with the angels and they're looking off and they can see Sodom? So Hebron, the way it sat at a higher altitude, was able to look down on Sodom and that whole Jordan Valley. That's where Lot, remember when Lot and Abraham need to split ways? Well, he tells Lot, go left, go right, whichever, I'll go the other. And he says Lot looked down and he looked at the whole Jordan Valley and saw that it was lush and I want to go there. That's where Sodom was. So you can see Sodom for where, from where Abraham was at. And some of the commentators suggested, well, Abraham supposed Lot to probably be dead and he was broken hearted so he left that place because he couldn't stand to look. Maybe, I don't know. I, if the Bible doesn't say that, could it be? Maybe. We're not told really why he left. Maybe famine hit. Remember when he went to Egypt? The Bible tells us, though, famine hit. So he took off on down to Egypt, and we saw that. That was a mistake. God never told him to go to Egypt. Egypt. So here he is again. He's just taking off. He's not consulting God. He's not asking God, Lord, what should I do? You told me to come to this area. You seem to be meeting me here, God. Should I go down that way? Lord, I'm having trouble staying here. Is there somewhere else I can go maybe? He just goes off on his own impulse. Every time Abraham goes out on an impulse, we find him doing things counterproductive to what appears to be the will of God. Remember he takes off to Egypt, what happens down there? He tells them that his wife is his sister, the king of Egypt takes his wife and it becomes a big issue. I don't know. Yeah. And he goes down there and makes an issue. I don't know it off the top of my head, but I know it has to deal with the woman. <laughs> There's that one too. Proverbs 5 is the adulterous three woman, five. isn't it? 3-5. Three 3-5. Five. Three five. I know Proverbs 5 is the adulterous woman, I believe. <laughs> but I had to memorize that one. Stay away from that adulteress. But, you know, uh, he goes down there on his own. And it turns into an issue because he went on his own accord. He didn't consult God. And he ends up back. Then Lot and his whole family and everybody in the Jordan Valley, they get taken captive by the kings of the north, remember? And they come and they wipe out all this place, all that Jordan Valley, Sodom, Gomorrah, all those cities, and they take them away captive. And what does Abraham do? He doesn't consult God either. He doesn't pray nothing. He just, I'm going to go save my nephew. And he goes up and he rescues everybody. God didn't tell him to do that. As a matter of fact, I believe God sent those kings to, to sack that land because of their wickedness. We went in that, in that teaching, we went through how God will do that to a nation that has disregarded him and his law and righteousness. God will bring other nations in to conquer them and remove them from the land. It's exactly what happened. Abraham goes and brings them back. So God's, okay. Bring them back from that. I'm convinced that had Abraham not went on his little conquest to rescue Lot and all the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, they wouldn't have been lynched the way they were last week. Because they literally went up in flames. Had they been dispossessed the way God typically does, I'm convinced they would have stayed alive. Lot would have been fine. Abraham just acting on his own impulse. Well, here he is again, acting on his own, own impulse. But the Abraham that's acting now is a little bit different than the Abraham that was acting then. Because in those instances, he wasn't Abraham. He was Abram. And then Abram, in his intimate encounter with God, God says, no longer shall you be called Abram, but you will be called Abraham. And as well as his wife, Sarai. She was no longer Sarai, but Sarah. And remember we talked about how the Hebrew letter He was placed in there? And He is... The Hebrew letter He is pictorial of God. And the difference between what Abraham was and what he was after that was God was now with him in a unique way. He's not the same Abraham, but yet he's acting on those old impulses. And it reminds me of us believers often, because what's Abraham doing? Well, Abraham was called to this promised land, right? Technically, Abraham is still in the promised land. He's still in the Negev. He's still in what we call Israel today. But he's worked his way on down towards Egypt. Does anybody remember what Egypt is a type of? It's a type of the world. And this is a picture of believers who 
they go towards the world. They just don't go into the world. Right? You ever been there with your walk where your walk isn't really what it's supposed to be? And you're going to kind of trek on down towards the world? I'm going to go by Egypt. I won't go to Egypt, though, because I'm a Christian. I don't go to Egypt. I just go by Egypt. I won't go there, though, because I'm a Christian. That's kind of where Abraham's at. And this is very patrol. And you're going to see what I mean. Because Abraham is going to do some shady crap right now. <laughs> Abraham and his flesh. So this is very pictorial of us when we backslide. If you've ever backslidden, this is kind of what it looks like. You take a trip on down towards the world. You just won't go to the world because I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. In verse 2 it says, Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. You heard that before? Remember he went to Egypt? She's my sister. Abraham's pulling old tricks out of his sleeve. She's my sister. The saddest part about this is he's not only belittling his wife, he's putting her in an extremely dangerous situation. Why? Well, let's finish verse 2. He, she said, um, she is my sister. He said, she is my sister. So Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. I would rather die than see another man take my wife. Or you take my wife, I'm going out shooting. <laughs> you know, it's not, you ain't just going to take my wife. You're going to take her from my cold, dead hands. That's it. It's the only way you're getting her. So you better be one hell of a shot. A good friend of mine. But, <laughs> but you know, Abraham in his flesh, though, was just, she's my sister. And we're going to see later on in the text, he's more worried about his self, his own flesh, his own hide. He, we're going to find he's afraid that the people might kill him because of his wife. Do you guys remember how old she is? She's 90 years old. What's he afraid of? Well, she must have been one hot 90-year-old lady. <laughs> you know, she's, got, she's got it going on. I don't know what that... She's probably almost as good-looking as my wife. That's brownie points. I said that in the earlier teaching. Oh, man. But Sarah, whatever she looked like, I can guarantee you this. She was supernatural. She was unnaturally beautiful. Whatever you have in mind to think more beautiful. Think the perfect curves. Think the perfect face. Wipe the wrinkles away. This chick had it going on. Because she just wasn't approached by anybody. The king took her. The king didn't worry himself with mediocre women. And a lot of us, what we think is, dang, is mediocre to a king. And it wasn't just the king of Gerar, Abimelech, that took her. The king of Egypt took her too. However she looked, she was uniquely and unnaturally beautiful, even though it was natural. I say unnatural because it doesn't compute. I see, think 90, I think all, you know, dentures and all, you know, but that wasn't her. Again, for the king to approach her, she had to be something special and unique. Like, she didn't even talk. You just look at her like, I want her. That's her. Bring her to my harem. And this happened because Abraham failed to protect his wife. She's my sister. Husbands, it is your job to protect your wife. It is your job to cover your wife, not just physically. Husbands, it is your job to cover your wife spiritually. Women aren't called to lead. Ah, that's sexist. Well, men aren't called to give birth, so we're fit, we're equal, fair, right? <laughs> men can give birth. Yeah, if you're mentally disordered, yes, they can. Like, But if you have a straight mind and a simple calculation of logic and science and Biology, XX chromosomes can only give birth and XY chromosomes cannot. Males and females to construct. No, it's not. Get out of here with that crap. Those are for people who have mental disorders. Men are men, women are women, period. Yes. What about the, 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 not the, what's not the example, the, um, the, not the rule, but the, uh, somebody give me the word. Can't think of it for the life of me. The exception. <laughs> They try to make the exception the rule. What about the hermaphrodite? No. Uh, go look at their, their, look at their DNA construct. If you really have that much trouble, look at the DNA. But 99.9999999% of the rest of us, you have a penis or a vagina. And it's that simple. 
Well, I don't think it is. You don't have to think it is. It's, it's biology, and it's been biology from the very get-go of humanity. Well, I don't think it doesn't matter what you think. That's the thing about science. Science doesn't care what you think. It's simple facts. Well, if you can't tell the difference between a vagina and a penis, then go get a blood test done, and what, if your chromosomes say XX, what are you? You're a woman. If they say XY, you're a man. Or just pull your pants down in the mirror and look and see what's there. And, and then you're good to go. You know, it really is that simple. I just, I, I'm baffled at, you know, our culture. You know, we have more people in our culture that go to college than in any other time in history, more than any other nation. And it's like the more educated people become, the stupider they get. It's incredible. It's just, it blows my mind. Because there's a difference between education and understanding and logic. You can be educated as an idiot if you're taught the wrong stuff. You're educated, yeah, but what, what is that education worth if you're taught nonsense? I'm educated in the streets. Does me no good in life. I can weigh out grams and ounces and I can weigh out drugs. What good does that do me in life unless I want to get shot, robbed, or go to prison? Your education is only as good as what you're learning. But lots of people are educated, but they're they're very stupid, the for lack of better grade, words. The they're rock. very stupid. High grade, yeah. yeah. It's, but it's very people are very disoriented. But don't get me thrown off. <laughs> you can get me distracted. But but he goes down to Gerar, and Abimelech takes her as his wife. This very unusually beautiful woman. And there's a principle that I wrote down on my notes that I'm going to tell you. Mm. Don't mess with somebody else's spouse. Mm. Do not do it. If you're married, stay away from other people's spouses. If you're not married, stay away from other people's spouses. In my opinion, if you mess with somebody's spouse and get killed, I understand why it was written in the law. Let's put it like that. Well, they, well actually, the law says they both should die. Because if they're both messing around, that's a, a sin deserving of death on both parties. Well, what about grace in the New Testament? Yeah, I mean, I get it. Be forgiven. But if you catch a hot one, I, I, I wouldn't blame the person. That is a, a trust. That is, man, I can't even to understand. I, I've never been cheated on, so I don't know. But that's got to be one of the most painful blows, one of the most, ah, that would corrupt somebody. Let's put it like that, you know. That would ruin somebody. That's why I believe the law said they both should die. Now, I'm not saying go kill somebody if they cheat on you. Don't do that. Because then you go to prison and you pay the... But my point is that I understand. But don't be messing with people's wives or spouses. As a matter of fact, if you're a Christian and you're not married, just stop. Don't have sex. Wait till you're married. And then you can really avoid not sleeping with somebody's spouse. And if you're married, just stick to your spouse. Well, I don't like what my spouse does. Then talk to him about it. Well, they can't fulfill me. Talk to them about it. Well, they should just know. I'm here to tell you, ladies, us men are idiots. If you don't tell us, we don't know. Tell us what you want. You can't talk about that. Stop me. You're, but none of these other churches are going to talk about it. We shut up and keep it quiet. But why do you think the divorce rate is so high? I think it's because of unfulfilled marriages. I think that's a big problem because I have learned, remember we talked about that hormone that women release, I should have got the name of it, that helps create pair bonding between couples. I, I just recently learned that comes through climax. There's a, whole, a certain hormone, I can't remember what it's called. Is it pheromone? No, I don't think it's pheromone. There's a certain uh, a chemical that's released in a woman's body when she climaxes that helps her pair bond to her mate. It's okay. God created us like this. Mm -hmm. Do what you have to do to fulfill your spouse. That's between you and them. That's between you, them, and God. Don't worry about what other path. Well, you can do only do this or that. You guys do what you both agree upon as long as you guys are okay with it and you believe you're right with God. And if you're not sure what that is, talk to me afterwards. I won't get detailed on here, but you know, talk to me afterwards. I'll tell you. Like, I think a lot of things are in bounds when it comes to marriage. A lot of things. Just missionary. Nah, I get out of here with that crap. <laughs> Again, I know that's that's rough, but I'm I'm serious. Spouses, make sure you're fulfilling your duty as a spouse. Not just one of the people being fulfilled, both.
it's really not that hard either. You just have to know what to do. And if you don't, again, talk to me and I'll, I'll tell you. I mean, <laughs> you know, <but laughs> that's a little weird, but I mean, I'm not, I'm not kidding though. I would rather be uncomfortable having that conversation and watch a marriage to succeed than for them to say nothing and them divorce. I'm serious. I know it's super uncomfortable. My mom is sitting right there. <laughs> but it's not about her. It's about the truth. My sister, my cousins, my aunt, uh, yeah. But it's what it is. Take it, take it as it is. That that is what it is. But we can move on. <laughs> Stay away from other people's spouses. <laughs> Verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream of the night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is married. Abraham failed to protect his wife. See, not only should Abraham have covered his wife, it's likely Abraham should never have been in this position to begin with. There's nothing that indicates that Abraham should have come down. He should have never been there. So God steps in. Thank God that God steps in. He tells him, you touch her, you're a dead man. Now, that's a mighty statement. Because that's not like, you know, if I say, if you touch my wife, you're a dead man, that's one thing. If God says it, it's not just a threat, it's a guarantee. God is truth. There is no lie in God, for he cannot lie. So when God says, if you touch him, you're a dead man, if you touch her, you're a dead man, that means you touch her and you're going to die. And then he goes on to say, not just you, but all of yours. You and yours will die. That's pretty important. Powerful and terrifying. That would suck to be Abimelech. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, God shows up and is like, "Bro, you're gonna die if you touch her." Like, in his mind, this chick is on limits. She's not off limits. She's not married, as far as he understands. Except God just said, "Now, for she's married, don't touch her." Huh? But what, what do you mean, Lord? So he says that now Abimelech makes his plea to God. Verse four. Now Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, will you slay a nation even though it is blameless? Did he not say himself to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother? In the integrity of my heart and in the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Abimelech says, Lord, I'm righteous in this. When he says I'm blameless, to be righteous, to be in right standing. What I have done isn't wrong, Lord. How have I, where am I wrong? Why, have, why is this coming on me? I did what was right in the integrity of my heart. Not that the nation in and of itself was in right standing with God. Only in this matter is the point. So it appears Gerar was not a very righteous place. But in this matter, what they did was right. Because he simply took a woman who appeared to be single, old and beautiful. I, mean, I feel like that's a dead giveaway. Like, come on, you know she's got somebody. <laughs> but, you know, he makes his case. In the pretense, he understood her to be free. Now, listen to verse 6. Then God said to him in a dream, yes. God agrees with him. You are blameless, Abimelech. You are right. You didn't do anything wrong necessarily. Yes. So God first says, touch her and I'll kill you for she's married. But Lord, I didn't know. You're right. Now listen to what God says. I know that in the integrity of your heart you have done this. And I also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Wow. That's powerful. Yes. I know that you're blameless in this. I know that in the integrity of your heart. That you are fully right in how you went about this. But she's married and therefore, I did not let you touch her, he says. Now, if you guys have been with us on Sunday mornings, we've kind of trailed through and talked about, you know, we've been going through through Romans and we just finished chapter 8 and in chapter 9 we talked about the uh, sovereignty of God and how God is in control and how God, you know, ultimately has the last say even though he's given us a free will and, you know, how does that work? How does God have full control yet we have the ability to choose and it's this mind-boggling concept that is... Well, we see it done here. God tells him, I stopped you from touching her. So what does that mean? Does that mean that Abimelech was trying to get her? I want to touch you. And he couldn't get past this. Oh, I'm almost there, but I can't get there. I stopped you. 
That's not what it means. It appears God used the circumstances of his day to keep him from going to be with her, to lay with her. That may look like there was war going on and he was preoccupied with, you know, military things. Or he was preoccupied with things as a king. And, you know, this will sound odd. Sorry if this is weird for you. But for those of you who are married or one day will be married or, you know, I never realized this. I, this sorry, I'm going to say this as it is. When I was a young Christian, and this will apply to some of you, I thought you get married and you just have sex all the time. Because when I was young, all I ever wanted to do, do was have sex. I just thought you get married and just all day long, you just. <laughs> and it, you know, when you get married, like, yeah, you make love and you have sex and whatnot, but the truth is, sometimes you're just tired. <laughs> As a dude, I never remember the first time I was like, I'm just tired, man. Like, and my wife was in the mood. And I was like, really? <laughs> you know, and I was just, I had a long day. I was beat, and I was like, and I was like, I, I remember thinking, like, I can't believe I just said that like you know but it, it's just the reality like you know when you get married it's 99% friendship and 1% everything else so I'll tell you if you're not married the greatest marriage you will ever be placed in is a marriage that's based on friendship because you that is most of the marriage you have to enjoy being around your spouse if they're just pretty pretty gets old fast there used to be this girl that I was interested in, and she was really, really beautiful. I couldn't stand her, though. Oh, you know, she used to bug me, but she was hot. And I was like, that's all I needed is just hot. And so, like, you know, and the more we got to know each other, I was like, man, we can be friends. Because if we got married, I'd kill you. <laughs> like, you know, like, this would end with me in prison. Like, I'm good. Like, you go, you know, there's a guy out there for you, and it is not me. I mean, she was, like, unusually beautiful. She was a really pretty girl. Not for me though. And Nick, the more I got to know her, like the less the looks matter. I was like, ugh. You know how it is like when somebody's good looking but their attitude sucks or, and I was like, you really aren't that pretty. <laughs> you know? If you close your mouth and say nothing, beautiful. <laughs> you start talking and all of a sudden it's like, ugh. You know? <laughs> Same with people that may not look the best. I remember there was this girl, you know, obviously I didn't marry her, but there was a girl I used to be interested in and I did not like her when we first met. I thought she was funky looking. I thought she was kind of weird, I'll be honest. But we became friends and I got to know her and I ended up really liking this girl. I was like, wow. And the more I hung out with her and got to know her, got to know her heart, I was like, this woman is really beautiful. That didn't work out, obviously, which I'm really glad because, you know, we have, we're way too different. And, and, and like the way we would raise kids and politics and some things have to match. But even when I met my wife, I wasn't interested in her at all. I was just... I used to talk to her about this girl I was just telling you about. <laughs> you know, like, but I wasn't interested in my wife. And then I got to know her, and all of a sudden, I was like, man, this woman is amazing. And then all of a sudden, she just was beautiful to me. Now I look at her, and I'm like, my wife is gorgeous. And I'm like, how could I not have seen that? There's this old saying, and I've never understood it so true until these moments. The um, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So some of you ladies, if you're single... There's going to be guys that come into your life that are interested in you and you're not going to like them because, oh, they're good friends. That's marriage material. You can get past the friend crap if you're willing, but you go chase the bad boy who you think you're going to change, you'll never change him. And if you do change him, you're not going to like what you change him into and you'll end up leaving him. Or he'll cheat on you because you changed him. I'm not, you think I'm kidding? Go out there and do some research. Women love to go after men that they can't have. It's like this. It's like a stupid switch that's somewhere up in there. Like, sorry, it, it, I'm sorry, lady. I'm not trying to be like guys are just as stupid. But I mean, I, I've never understood this. When I was in high school, girls, oh, you're just a good friend. You know how? You know how I was able to get girls when I was younger. Guys don't take notes on this, but I'll tell you how. I was a creep to them, and I never understood it. I was like, you are one stupid human being. If I treat you good, I'm friend material. And then I start treating you like crap, and now you love me. I'll tell you what that's called. That's called being a little girl. There's a lot of ladies out there that are old, but they're just little girls. Let me explain to you what a woman wants. Companionship. A woman wants a man who's going to love her. A woman doesn't want to find a man and change him. A woman wants a man who's going to lead. 
And if you're watching this or you're hearing, you're one of those girls, well, I want a man that I can change, then you're a little girl. <laughs> and you need to shed that and become a woman. And I'm putting that more on the woman than on the man because when I see relationships fail, often it's the woman belittling the man to the point where he's just, you lead, baby. And then I'm, I'm telling you, just, it always falls apart. So it is on the men too. You gotta grow a pair and just be a man about it. Be a man. But I mean, it, it really is both parts. But for you ladies, I'm serious. The guy that's marriage material is the guy that seems like a really good friend because that is marriage. I'm sorry to break it to you. That that is marriage. If you're not best friends with your spouse, your marriage is gonna suck. Because you have to sleep with them, wake up with them, spend all day with them, weekends with them, you go on vacation with them. They're just always there. <laughs> Anybody married want to disagree with that? Am I lying? If you're not best friends with your spouse, your marriage is going to suck. So shed that mentality that we've learned from the world. We're just friends. Marriage material. Marriage material. That's the guy that's going to wait on you hand and foot. Why do you want the dude who's going to treat you like crap? I never understood that. Because you can't have him. Until you're 35 and you're getting old and you realize you're alone and now you realize that was stupid to chase that because now you've matured. M mature now. But anyways, I'm just talking and I don't know why I'm talking about that. That's for somebody online or in here. There's some young girls in here. So some young guys in here. You know, but take that to heart, you guys. I'm serious. Um, anyways, that being said, where I'm at, Abimelech not going into his into Sarah, who technically part of his wives now, but God keeps him from it, not by holding him back, but through possible circumstances in his life, just tired or whatever, he keeps him from going into her. And God tells him in verse 7, let me go back into verse 6 just to keep the context. He says, therefore I did not let you touch her, at the end of verse 6, now 7. Now therefore restore the man's wife, for he's a prophet, and he will pray for you and you will live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. Abimelech, give her back. Now. Give her back, he'll pray for, for you guys and you'll be good. Don't, and you and everybody's gonna die here. The love that God has for Abraham is astounding. But mind you, God's promise rests on these two people. God promised that through Abraham, a specific seed would come. They thought that was Ishmael. God shows up again 13 years later and says, nope. It's going to be through your wife, Sarah. So this is a really important union here. Because God's promise, it's never really at stake because his, what he says will come to pass. But I mean, can you imagine if Abimelech did go into Sarah? Isaac would be questionable. Is he Abraham's or is he Abimelech's? The promise was that he would come through Abraham and Sarah specifically. Otherwise, Ishmael would be sufficient. So this is a very important union. And God intervenes in a unique way. And again, he tells them, I'll wipe this city out. And I'm sure for them, they just saw the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah. Can you imagine if we looked out on Saul Road Rancho get wasted with fire and brimstone and we know God did that and then God shows up to you in a dream and says, hey, you better watch out here or else. I mean, that's something you're not going to play with. You just saw these, these places get wiped out supernaturally on an atomic scale. Atomic bomb scale, I should say. On a nuclear scale is the proper way to say that. I mean, can you imagine the fear in these people? Or not, we'll see here in a moment. In verse 8, it says, So Abimelech arose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their hearing. And the men were greatly frightened. Yeah, they were scared. I would be scared too. I would be scared if I didn't see the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah. But having seen that, I would be greatly afraid shaking in my boots, so to speak. Now, it's fascinating and it's sad when the world has a greater fear of God than the people of God do. These men are terrified of what they just heard. 
you would think that same fear would have filled Abraham and kept him from going down there and kept him from playing these shenanigans and kept him from saying my wife is my sister you think the fear of God would grip him you think he'd remember the promise of God and say Lord God you've promised Lord and you will accomplish like he kind of already has but now he's just on a backsliding scale and and it appears that the people of the world so to speak have a greater fear of God than Abraham the man of God the friend of God as he will be called later I see this in the church often, and I'm going <laughs> to, I'll share it with you guys in a moment, because I received a rebuke once from somebody in the world, and it was embarrassing. It's embarrassing still, but I'm going to share it with you guys anyway, just not quite yet. It says, they were greatly frightened. Verse 9, then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, what have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. What have you done to me? What did I do to you, Abraham, that you would do this to me? When the world is appalled by the sin of the believer, it's kind of like, you guys are you guys familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter 5? I'll give you some context. There is this guy in the church, right? And he's super proud of what he's doing. He's sleeping with his mother-in-law. And they're boasting and bragging about it. Because the grace of God is sufficient. And Paul says, right, says, uh-uh. Kick him out of the church. Sends him a letter. Now, kick him out. Doing that type of sin. And Paul mentions that type of sin that even the world looks at and says, What? You're doing what? And you're a Christian? And he, they weren't supposed to be kicked out just to be kicked out. The point of kicking them out was so that they would repent. Because then you go to 2 Corinthians chapter, I think it's 4 or 5, and Paul says if they've repented, bring them back in, man. Like, don't leave them out. The point of being removed, if somebody's ever such indulged in such sin and they're refusing to repent in the church, the Bible does say remove them. You guys, if you refuse to repent and you call yourself a Christian, you got to go, bro. And if you go to another church, we call the church, hey, look, this is what this guy is doing. He's married, sleeping around. You, we've removed him, church discipline, get him out. Paul says the point of that is to deliver him to Satan so that they would be brought to naught, so that they would repent. And if they repent and are willing to come back into the church, we restore them back in. You never just leave them out. The point of church discipline is to bring them back in, not just to kick them out for the sake of showing, hey, we can kick you out. Like, I'm terrified if we ever have to do church discipline. I'll be honest with you. I'm like, I'm super terrified of that. It's like, how do you go about that? But I'd imagine in a moment as that, God would give you the grace and the necessary words. And it would be done with great trepidation and a broken heart. I would never want to have to ask somebody to leave. But if you're a Christian and you're a professed Christian and you're living in a lifestyle that is blatantly against Christ and you refuse to acknowledge it as sin, to the door, man. You're welcome to leave. So what the Bible says, oh, that's messed up. Well, actually, it says, first approach them and talk to them about it. And if they refuse to accept the correction, bring the elders of the church. And if they refuse to, bring them before the church. And if they're still like, no, there's the door. And if they go to another church, call the church. Eh? This is what's going on with them. And again, again, it's not to ruin their life. It's to break them of that sin so that they would repent. Is that harsh? Yes. Did I make that up? No. Do I want to do that? No. Will I do that? Yeah. Being a pastor sucks sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I got to make calls that I don't want to make. But if it's for the sake of righteousness and for the kingdom of God, now again, I don't care how heinous the sin is. If the person is willing to acknowledge it as sin and repent, I don't care what you've done. You're welcome here. You are welcome here. What if I fall again? I don't just get up and wipe yourself off. Repent. You are welcome here. It's to the one who refuses to acknowledge it as sin and refuses repentance. That's the issue. So I just realized that. So if that ever happens, I'm so sorry. But <laughs> I don't know what else to say. But here, Abimelech is rebuking the man of God. You're a man of God, Abraham. And why have you done this to me? What have I done to you to deserve this? 
told you about my little uh, venture that got me rebuked by a little maiden lady. I was in my freedom as Christ, you know, my freedom of Christ. I was in my moment of drinking and because I'm free in Christ. You can drink. But I didn't know how to just drink. I knew how to be drunk. So I was getting drunk every day. And I used to work down the street from the Monte Carlo. So me and the boss went there to have lunch. And I, we sat at the bar. And I remember I told the lady, something strong. I, I don't remember what it was. Something good and strong. So she pours me a, it's called a liquid marijuana. Now, I don't know exactly what went in there, but I know a lot of liquor went in there because I watched her make it. She made it in front of me. I was like, whoa, I drank two of them. And then I think I drank a, like a Long Island iced tea or something. I don't know what I just, I got crap faced. I was drunk. I was, there's only been like two times in my life ever and one when I was, I was an unbeliever and one in this moment where I got so drunk, I was completely inebriated. I couldn't, I was just, I couldn't even work for the rest of the day. I had to go sit in my car. I ended up throwing up all over the place and it was disgusting. I've only been drunk that, drunk twice. And actually this, that time was worse than the first. And I was a Christian. And I sit in there getting all plastered and this little native lady walks in and sits down next to me and I got my big old beautiful Bible just sitting there. And that's when I used to rock this one girly Bible case. And I used to do it on purpose. It was turquoise with rhinestones and it had a cross as rhinestones and it looked a little fruity. But I did it on purpose so that people would kind of make fun of me and laugh at it and then I'd get to tell them it's a Bible and tell them about Jesus. And it worked all the time. I'd always, ah, oh, your purse, hey, it's a Bible, let me tell you about Jesus. And then their face would kind of change, so it's a Bible. You know, and, and I got, I pulled all kinds of people and like, they didn't see it coming. I get them, bam. So I got to just sit in there getting all drunk, stupid. So later the lady comes in, sits down, orders a drink and says, what's that? And the way I thought I sounded, I probably said, oh, that's my Bible. What I probably actually sounded like was, that's my Bible. <laughs> and she looks at me and she says, what are you doing here? I said, the Bible says, you can drink, just not be drunk. And I mean, I probably looked like an idiot and sounded like an idiot. And I wasn't wrong to the text. The Bible says we can, you can drink. It just says not to be drunk with intoxication. You shouldn't be drunk with dissipation. And she looked at me. And this little lady, who I, don't, I doubt she knew Jesus. She just looks at me and says, you don't belong here. What are you doing here? You need to leave. I felt so ashamed. I felt ashamed. <laughs> I was getting rebuked by a little drunk native lady. And I was supposed to be the man of God being the testimony. I wonder often if my actions that day caused that lady to stumble later on in life. I wonder if one day she's being presented the gospel and maybe was even going to accept the gospel, but thought of that guy at the bar. You Christians are nothing but hypocrites. I wonder if I... I know I gave her an occasion to blaspheme God. What up, Dave? That's a good-looking haircut, bro. I don't know who did that. But. <laughs> but I know for a fact that I gave her an occasion to blaspheme God. Can you imagine that? I still think about that. I don't know what happened to her. But what if she never accepted God in part because my actions testified against God because of how I was that day. Because I wasn't just buzzed, I was straight thrown. I was done, I was, I was jacked up. And it was undeniable. Oh, well, it could have been, but I don't know if angels drink liquor because she drank. Now maybe they do, but I don't know, but it, did, it doesn't matter what it was. The fact was, it wasn't a Coke, is that I know that much. The fact is though, my actions flew in the face of God. This is what Abraham is doing. And again, this is all too common amongst believers. We live, we say we live one way. We say we believe one way. And then when we live a life contrary to what we claim we believe, and nobody's saying be perfect. God doesn't expect perfection. But God expects us to be conscious. God expects us to be you know, conscious of our decisions, especially when we're in the face of the world. I would say this, if you really enjoy drinking, don't do it in public. Especially if you call yourself a Christian. Could you? Yes, you could. Don't get drunk. If you get drunk, the Bible simply says you and I are, if you, we get drunk, we're wrong. Can you drink? Yes. Be careful though, especially if you're a professed Christian. Because if you, 
somebody that sees you, let's say somebody, Joe, has been coming to church, Joe somebody, and Joe somebody sees you out at Applebee's and you're sitting there hounding down a Bloody Mary or, is that a drink? Is that a, is that an alcohol drink? Yeah. All right, Bloody Mary. And it's a, got that nice vodka in there and you're just, or your margarita, whatever. And Joe somebody sees you and they're like, and Joe somebody struggles with alcohol. And he's been clean for a couple months now. He's serving Jesus and, hey, that's Walter, that's the pastor. Yes. Hey, is that margarita? We can drink? Well, the pastor drinks. The Bible condemns that on our part. Yeah. Be careful. Be careful what we do in public when we're Christians because we are representing God. So I tell Christians, if you really want to drink, just do it at home. You don't have to do it at home. You could do it in public. Just realize if you cause somebody to stumble, God will hold that against you. That will be on your account. And that is biblical. Just be careful how we produce ourselves in public. Here Abraham is, and he's smearing the name of God. God tells Abimelech he's a prophet. Can you imagine? I would imagine Abraham was probably embarrassed. You're a prophet, and this is how you act? Your wife is your sister. Hmm. Going forward. Verse 11. Listen to what Abraham has to say about this. Oh, verse 10 first. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What have you encountered that you have done this thing? Verse 11. Abraham said, Because I thought surely there is no fear of God in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. That's Abraham's excuse. Abimelech rebukes him and calls him out. Why have you done What have we done to you? What happened to you that made you do this to us? God just promised to wipe us out if I don't give her back. What did we do to you to, to deserve this, Abraham? I thought you guys were a bunch of heathens, which they, they were. But I thought there was no fear of God in this place, and I figured you'd kill me and take my wife. Why would they kill him and take his wife? Because she was a hottie. But I find it astounding that he says, I thought you guys didn't fear God. Okay, we don't know exactly where they stood. We know in this moment they feared God for sure. But mind you, I'm sure Sodom is fresh in their minds and Gomorrah, the, the, the overthrow. Say they didn't fear God, right? Is someone else's disobedience to God, does that then make our disobedience to God acceptable? Okay, you don't fear God, and so you're gonna give. So should I now disobey God and belittle my wife and treat her as a sister and in the eyes of you guys because you guys might be disobedient to God and have no fear of Him? The answer is no. Well, I don't want to rep Jesus over there. What if they don't like Jesus and they won't like me? Well, if that's how you feel, would you really choose to disobey God because somebody else might not like Him or be disobeying them himself themselves? We should never follow that route. Don't worry about what other people are doing. If, if somebody else isn't following God, you follow God. If your spouse isn't following God, you follow God. Yes. You can't control everybody else. You can control you. I can control me. Sometimes. Mostly. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> but let's say I'm disobeying God. Should that give, does that give my wife a license then to not follow me or the direction that God is leading us? <coughs> Unless I'm calling her to sin. I mean, my disobedience to God shouldn't affect her obedience to God. Likewise, her disobedience to God shouldn't affect my obedience to God. You are responsible for your actions. So don't worry about what they're doing. I thought there was no fear of God in this place. Here comes my second question. If he thought he would kill them and there's no fear of God in this place, what are you doing there then, Abraham? Why are you there? Dude, if I knew that if I went to Española... And if I thought in my heart they're going to kill me and take my wife, you know where I'm not going? Espinola. I'm not going to Espanola. <laughs> I mean, I feel like that's a common, one of those common sense moves. If you really felt this way, why are you there, Abraham? What are you doing? <laughs> We're never told why Abraham went down to Gerar, to the Negev. He just went. When he went to Egypt, we're told there was great famine in the land. He goes down to Egypt. He was still wrong. Yeah. We're told why he went and rescued Lot, because he was taken captive. We're not told why he came down here. 
It's so unimportant, it wasn't even recorded. Whatever you were looking for down here, Abraham, is it not possible that God could have provided for you what you needed up in Hebron? Where your place of meeting with God was at? Sometimes the church goes down and towards the world looking for the, our needs. Stay in Hebron. Stay in the place where you meet God, and God will meet your needs. He doesn't meet our needs the way we want Him always, but He meets our needs because He is our God and He loves us. Realize that. In verse 12, he says, Besides, I'm going to read, read verse 11 into 12. Abraham said, Because I thought surely there is no fear of God in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she actually is my sister. I don't fully know what to do with that. <laughs> yeah, I spent quite a bit of time on this verse. And there's some things we have to take into consideration. This simply may have been a cultural norm. This simply might be how part of that culture operated and, and worked. To this day, in some parts of the world, you marry off close in the family. And genetically speaking, I believe you can marry your second cousin and still be genetically safe. Is that correct? Third? Is it third? Third cousin, it used to be second. But third cousin, and so, so, so you, you can some people do marry within the family. I know we look at that and go, eh, but that's just the culture. Like for us, our culture says, you know, you're not an adult till you're 18. In a lot of cultures, you know, girls are considered child, they're not considered scientific, they're biologically, girls are considered childbearing age at age 12 and 13. I know we look at that and go, Ugh! but in some cultures, that's that's considered a woman. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that's what it is. I can make a case against us. Well, 18 is it. I'm here to tell you when I was 18, I was a stupid, idiot little kid. I wasn't an adult. Legally, I was an adult. Literally, I was an idiot. So, I mean, I'm just saying cultures are different in other places. And I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's the, they're the culture. Typically, by 18, ladies, you're already kind of getting... You guys only have so many eggs in so many years. By the time you get into your mid-30s, if you don't got kids, you may not ever be having kids. So these girls that, I'm going to go live wild and free, make a career, and then I'll have kids. Nah, probably not. For several reasons. Because if you're wild and free, no guy's going to want you at that age, probably. Right. Two, your body starts to shut down on that level in your 30s. And my wife is pregnant, and she'll be 35 next month. Medically, she's considered an old pregnancy. Medically. The doctors marked her down as a little bit of a higher risk. And as you continue to get older, the risk gets significantly higher. Yes. And typically, by the time you hit your 40s, you're not even able to bear kids anymore, typically. And it's rare to see somebody in their 40s and 50s give birth. It's not a commonality. Because the older a woman gets, the more hostile her body becomes to that pregnancy. It's just a reality. And either the mom will die, the baby will die, or both will die in pregnancy. Not always, but my, my wife's a labor and delivery nurse, so I learned all this good stuff. You know? <laughs> but, huh? What about her? Oh, yeah, my grandma. My dad was the last born out of eight kids. And my dad, I think, the birth with my dad made my grandma super sick, and it was... She had her, and her, my dad in her 40s and stuff, and it was, I think, did not almost die when she gave birth to dad. So, so she hemorrhaged and she almost died giving birth to my dad. And that was it for her. That was the last kid. But women, as your bodies get older, like, it, it doesn't last forever. Guys, unfortunately, for you, we can go till we're 90. As long as a man's alive, he can produce semen that is life-giving. Women, your eggs have an expiration date on them. I, science. I didn't make that up. That's biological science. You can, any basic textbook will teach you that. But this may have been simply a cultural norm to marry close into the family is the point that I'm getting at. Now, there are theories of unpolluted bloodlines that suggest that such marriages were genetically safe. So I'm going to give you an example. When Adam and Eve were created, because they weren't birthed, they were created, from them came the human race. Well, that's a problem. Because anybody that marries after that is, has to marry a sibling. Doesn't matter. There's no way around it. 
But again, it's believed that the bloodline was pure. This is a theory that nobody can prove it because we were not there. You can't pull the sample from Adam, Eve, or any of the early humanity. But the theory is because the bloodline was pure, there was no pollution to it, that they were able to cohabit without genetic disorder. And as the bloodline got further, there were impurities that were that came that started to become a problem. So it appears that by this time, to marry a half-sister didn't appear to be that big of an issue genetically. Now again, this isn't scientific. I can't give you, this is theory. Because the truth is, we don't know. We just know for today, because we have today's science for what's going on today. But this is a reality of things that did happen. And there wasn't necessarily genetic mutations that we're aware of. I mean, I'm sure at some point it started happening. That's how they became evident. But the closer you get to the human beginning, the purer the blood. So it appears that the closer you get, the more pure the bloodline, the more genetically suitable it was that this was able to take place without any genetic issues. But that's about all I know on that. So you can do your own research or whatever. And that's what it is. But here in verse 13 now, so he says, she is my sister. I didn't read verse 12. The daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. So they weren't full brother and sister, but for us, that's still freaky and weird. Don't, don't be sleeping with your sisters and brothers and cousins. and <laughs> don't, do it, don't do that, man. That's not our culture. That's not cool. But not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. Verse 13, And it came about when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said to her, This is the kindness which you will show me. Everywhere we go, say of me, He is my brother. Abraham is revisiting his agreement with Sarah. There is a problem here. That was 25 plus years ago. In this it's been about a good 25 years or more since that took place here's the big problem Abraham wasn't the same person then and neither was Sarah they were Abram and Sarai and somewhere along the lines they had a unique encounter with God and God told them your names shall no, shall no longer be these Abraham Abram your name will now be Abraham Sarai your name will be Sarah and when we went through that study, we saw that what God did is he took the Hebrew letter He and he inserted it in their name. And we saw that the Hebrew letter He was symbolic for God. What's the difference between who Abraham was and who Abraham now is here in chapter 20? Is God. That's the difference. God is, with, God is uniquely with him. You're no longer that person, Abraham. Why are you revisiting the past? Why are you surfacing things that shouldn't be surfaced? Have you ever done that as a Christian? Where you pull old things out of your trick hat? Well, I used to do this. You're not the you you used to be. You are different if you're born again. Don't be the old you. The Bible says you are a new creature. And if we're new creatures, we ought to act like new creatures. Now I'm as guilty as all of you. I have my moments where I pull old tricks out of my hat. And you know what I do when I do that? I repent. Because I'm wrong. Like sometimes somebody will dog me and I'll be like, what? And I'm like, oh Lord, I'll just look away. And sometimes, I, I, I'll be honest, it bothers me because I feel like a wussy. I feel like a little weenie. I'm like, my flesh wants to dog him. Be like, what, bro? I'll grab your face and slam you into the ground. And then come to church. You know, like, come on, like... <laughs> I mean, once, I told you guys about that time, I was in the wrong. You know, I was driving right here off of a <laughs> Ladera, and I was not I was kind of in the left lane, not going too fast, like 30, and it's like 35, and this guy cuts around me to pass me. So I did what any Burkeño does. I pressed the gas harder. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't saying I was right, I'm just saying I did it. And so, and the guy just wanted to pass me. And then he got mad and started honking. Rah, 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 rah. I rolled down my window and I said, what? Pull over, bro. It was about two years ago, three years ago. And rah, 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 I ran in the mouth and I said, and he turned off and I was like, Lord, what was I thinking? Imagine one day he shows up in the church. What? This is the guy who's, who rubbed my face into the ground. I had a gun on me. What if I had shot him? What the heck was I? That was old Walter. What was going on in my mind? After that, I was just, I felt horrible. I was repenting. I went home like bad in tears. Like, God, I'm so sorry. Like, even with that, what if he shows up to church? Hey, that's that guy. You're a pastor. <sighs> what an idiot. 
I was. Oof. Abraham is revisiting all the things. Remember 25 years ago when we used to be different people? We said that we'd say you're my sister. Say it again because I'm afraid. Abraham must have forgot the promises of God. Abraham must have forgot that God promised him, Abraham, you're going to have a son. Here's his name. Sarah's going to have him. Abraham can't die. God, God promised this would happen. It's not happened yet. Abraham, dude, he's basically invincible at minimum until this is accomplished. At minimum. We learn Abraham's going to live another 75 years after this. He dies at 175. Wow. So, I mean, did Abraham forget the promises of God? Maybe. Proverbs 26.11 says, Like a dog that returns to its vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. I was a vomit-licking dog when I did what I did. I was wrong. Don't be like me in that aspect. I was wrong. You're new. Act new. I should act new. We ought to act new. Will you have faults? Yes. I'm not saying you won't. What I'm saying is when you have them, recognize it, repent, move forward. In spite of Abraham's folly, God still blesses him. Look at verse 14. Abimelech then took up sheep and oxen and male and female servants and gave them to Abraham and restored his wife Sarah to him. Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Settle wherever you please. Despite Abraham's disobedience and sin, God still blesses him. That is my son, yeah. Somebody said it's Ezekiel. That's yeah, my boy, sorry. Um, despite his sin, God still blesses him. Realize that's how much God loves you and I also. When you sin, God will still bless you, not because of your sin, because he loves you. God will also allow judgment to fall on you because he loves you. Realize that. This really stretches out that verse we learned here just the, la the last couple weeks, that verse 28 of chapter 8 of Romans. I can't even remember the verse. I quoted it earlier and I can't remember now. Somebody quote it for me. 828 Romans. And we know. That God works all things. We know that God, thank you. And we know that God works all things together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. Abraham's been called. God will still bless him. Abraham's going to suffer because of this. There's going to be some issue now, but God's still going to bless him. Realize, just because you messed up doesn't mean God won't bless you. You will have some issues. But God, if you are called by him, will protect you and God will continue to bless you and God will continue to move you forward. And don't think blessing is necessarily monetarily. Some blessings are just peace of mind. In this case, it's monetarily. You got hooked up with a bunch of servants and we're going to see silver and donkeys. and A scam. <laughs> don't think that if you go down towards Egypt, you're going to get donkeys and silver. I doubt it, but it might get a swift kick in the butt from God. But Verse 16. Oh, so first he gives him these things and he tells him, take your pick of the land. It's yours. Go for it. Verse 16, he says to Sarah, he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, it is your vindication before all who are with you and before all men you are cleared. That must have stung. Did you pick up on that? Your brother. You guys want to play brother and sister? I gave this to your brother. And I'd imagine he did that with a look on his face and a tone in his voice that was probably appropriate because of how they acted with him in that sense. Mm -hmm. Your brother. Man, you disgusting people. You guys disgust me. You call yourself Hebrews. <laughs> Just kidding. It, was, it would have been Hebrews and there wasn't Christians yet. But I do want to point this out when it says, man, only one person laughed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought my jokes are funnier than that. I guess they're not. But... You one. laughed on the inside. <laughs> In verse 16, when it says here that, Behold, it is your vindication. In the Hebrew, this is two words. It's kasut ayin im. Kasut ayin im. And it literally means to cover the eyes. Behold, this is to cover your eyes. This was a metaphor in this day of a gift. I'm going to make a quick turn right away to Genesis chapter 32 so you can kind of see how it plays out. Because in our culture, it doesn't make sense to cover the eyes. I give you this to your brother to cover your eyes, huh? And it's basically, the point is to cover what has been done. But look what he says here. The context in Genesis chapter 32, we're going to get there in probably a couple of weeks or a month or two months, something like that. 
And there's this guy named Jacob and this guy named Esau. They're twins. They're going to come from Isaac, not yet born. He'll be born next week in the text. And Jacob is going to do his brother dirty, just straight dirty. First, he's going to not rob him of his, his birthright, but he's going to kind of dupe him out of it. Like, he makes a bowl of stew. It's shysty. He makes a bowl of stew, and Esau, who was the firstborn, they're twins, but Esau came out first. He's hungry. I'm hungry. I'm going to die. Give me a bowl of stew. Jacob says, give me your birthright, and I'll give you a bowl of stew. I mean, it's his stew. He can ask whatever he wants of it. Well, the idiot says, okay, what's my birthright to me if I die? It's yours. Give me the stew. Then later on, Jacob dupes him out of his blessing because the firstborn, the firstborn would get a birthright and a blessing from the father, which was a big deal in these cultures. And Jacob got the birthright and stole the blessing. And because of this, Esau wanted to kill him. So he flees off, goes into his uncle Laban for 20-some years. He's on his way back. And he finds out his brother Esau is coming to meet him. Now Jacob is, is kind of like one of those weenie guys. Soft skin, not much hair, kind of like the effeminate hands probably. He's a mama's boy. Esau is a man's man. Big, muscular, hairy, a hunter. Jacob is in the kitchen cooking, baking cookies with his mom. Esau's afraid, uh, Jacob's afraid of Esau, rightly so, because Esau would wipe him out. He hears his brother Esau's coming. He remember what he did to him 20-some years ago. I don't think Esau let that go. So he starts sending gifts ahead of him. Donkeys and camels and well, I don't know exactly. i got to look at the text. But sending presents and presents and presents and presents in front of him. Give it to Esau and keep calling me his servant. That's the context. And in chapter 32, verse 20, it says, And you shall say, Behold, your servant Jacob also is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. Then afterward, I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. The word appease there is the same word as he shall see my face. It's the same idea as to cover the eyes. So my point is that these words are semi-interchangeable. So to cover the eyes means to appease with the present, so to speak. And so that's what Abimelech is saying here, that, you're, that I have covered your eyes with your brother by paying him this. And it ends verse 16 saying, before all men you are cleared. Basically, I've made right, is his point. In verse 17, it says, Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maid so that they bore children. For Yahweh had closed fast all the wombs of the household of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Now, we're almost done. I'm late. I'm looking at my clock. Oh, crap. My wife's going to be mad. But we're, we're finishing up in like two minutes. It says all the wombs were closed fast. That tells me that something physical took place in the women of the land of Gerar, that they knew their wombs were shut up. And it brought my mind to that woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years in the New Testament, remember? And it says she had a bleed for 12 years. Well, if you have a menstrual bleed, you can't give birth. Your womb is technically shut up. And I wonder, I'm not saying it did, but I'm wondering if God set all these women off into their menstrual cycle, even some of that were out of whack. Imagine if you ended your menstrual cycle and two days later you're bleeding again. And all of a sudden you hear all the ladies are bleeding. God has shut up our wombs because you can't get pregnant if you're hemorrhaging or if you're menstruating. So it appears that there was a physical thing that took place that they all knew that they were shut up. And it says, Abraham prayed for them so that they bore children. And lastly, Abraham prayed for Abimelech. Abraham and Abimelech were technically enemies, especially because of what Abraham did. And it brings me to a verse in chapter 5 of Matthew, verse 43 and 44. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. It's not an easy one to accept. Abraham was right in praying for him. And for us as believers, when we are persecuted, our thoughts are often curse them. But the Bible says that we should pray for those who persecute us. When you're done wrong by a pastor, pray for that pastor. When you've been done wrong by the church, pray for that fellowship. When you've been done wrong by a boss, pray for that boss. Well, it's not easy. I didn't say it was easy. I said do it. Jesus said to do it. Because when we do it, we are like him. 
Do you remember what he did on the cross as they were hurling abuse at him? Those two thieves were on the side blaspheming him. Father, forgive them. To the, all them and all these people, they just crucified. He's dying. He's, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. One of the thieves cries out, He's righteous and we're not. And I'm paraphrasing. We're cursing him. Look, he's blessing us. He's praying for us. We ought to be like that. Didn't say it was easy. But if you want to be like Jesus, pray for your enemies. And that's how we end out chapter 20. And next week we get into chapter 21 and we're going to see Isaac being born. Laughter is his name. And we're going to get some joy out of the text because the text for the last few weeks has been a little melancholy. You know, but next week we're going to look at Isaac being born, this promised son who's 25 years in the making as far as they're concerned, 25 plus years. But So join us next week. Father, we thank you for being God and for your goodness, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for this beautiful body of people that are here to hear your word for those online. We pray that each of us, Lord, that are here this evening would be moved by your word, that we would be filled with your spirit, that your word would cut away in us the things that shouldn't be there and fill us with the things that should. Help us to walk with you, to walk in you, to be obedient to your call, to hear your voice. Would you uphold us with your righteous right hand and cause your face to shine on us? And would you have your way in us, Lord? Go with us through the rest of this week and just direct our paths, Lord. We love you, and most of all, we thank you for loving us, Lord. And we bless you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.